Thank you so much to all the pastoral staff and all the church staff for envisioning this weekend. I know that uh, you have to press through a lot to hold an event like this because God does great things in the lives of people in events like this, and so it takes somebody to fight behind the scenes, to dream, to plan, to do all the, the legwork. So just on behalf of my wife and I, and I know all the guests that are here, thank you for working hard to bring us all together. And uh, I know that we're not just a, a meeting somewhere in the back of God's mind tonight. I know that this is a meeting, this is an event that's at the forefront of God's mind, just like each of you here is always at the forefront of his mind. That's something I love about God. We talk about the unstoppable gospel, but I'm thankful for his unstoppable focus on us here. I'm thankful that we don't have to try and manipulate his attention to what we're doing. He's fixed on us tonight, and he's fixed with purpose, and he wants to do something extraordinary in our hearts this weekend. And as we've been praying, my wife and I, for this weekend of meetings, this has been our prayer. Lord, would you do something extraordinary for the people of Hill Country Fellowship, for the guests that are traveling to be here in each of our lives because you're an extraordinary God and, and Lord, you don't, you're not interested. You don't craft uh, average meetings. You're an extraordinary God who likes to meet people in extraordinary ways. So why not this weekend something extraordinary? I hope you'll join me in expecting something extraordinary from the Lord. I'm a big believer in special events like this. It was 50 years ago last month. I was seven years old. My mom and dad took me to a meeting in Southern California. Some of you have heard of Brother Andrew, still alive, used to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And they took me as a seven-year-old boy to a mission event where he was speaking. And it's the first memory I have of uh, God specifically stirring my heart about world mission and about evangelism. I remember listening to him talk about smuggling Bibles and the thought dropping into my head, I'm going to do that one day. Of course, it wasn't a mature, developed thought, but I recognize in retrospect it was a thought from God. And I've learned that, that even in the youngest children that are in meetings like this, to the oldest of us, that God is still in the business of dropping thoughts that might seem like random thoughts into our mind, but they're not random. And so you might have a scary thought that you might want to dismiss as a random thought during this meetings that, yeah, maybe you'll go to Matamoros or Rudoso or to Peru or something like, like that. Let's not easily dismiss the Spirit of God. He speaks in meetings like this. He speaks about each one of our purposes and our callings. And I'm thankful that he spoke that seemingly random thought to me 50 years ago. Quite fascinating, someone that several of us know, Dave Drick. I found out talking to him, he was in the same meeting in January of 1970 with Brother Andrew. He was seven years old, because Dave and I are the same age, and we both were spoken to by the Lord. So 50 years later, there's a couple of boys that were in that meeting, and who knows how many others that are still applying ourselves to the call of God. You know, God is relentless in his passion for this task to be completed. I had an experience about 20-some years ago. At, what, at the time, I thought, it, it can't get any better than this. We were in a very remote part of tribal India. We are partnered with uh, a group that works there and kind of keeps pushing the boundaries to tribes and villages and people groups that haven't been reached. And we had been uh, gone back into a very uh, unreached area. 
and uh, entered an area where they had not had people like us, Westerners, before. So we were kind of a, an oddity to that tribal group. Had to speak through a couple translators. But I remember just the exhilaration of knowing that we were in a village that these people had not previously known about Jesus. Uh, an advance evangelist from their uh, area had gone in briefly in the weeks preceding, but they really didn't know anything. It was still dark. They were still under the the uh, control of the local witch doctor. And I remember it, that witch doctor, and he was a very tormented person by evil. And I remember him acting out and and the powers of darkness acting out through him as we preached. And I remember thinking, man, this is a disaster because he appeared uh, not only drunk, but he appeared like he was on the verge of ordering everybody in the village to just kill us. It, it was a crazy thing, and, and we're there preaching this very simple gospel message, but wondering if anything is going to happen, and then giving an invitation, and realizing that all the villagers are kind of frozen watching their witch doctor, their, their spiritual chief, to see what he was going to do, and watching him come up under the conviction of God's Spirit, and surrender his life to Christ and be translated from darkness to light. And then, as a, a, a much younger preacher than I am now, watching every person in the village, that was their signal that it was okay for them to respond to what they were feeling too because they were all feeling that same pull and draw of an unstoppable God who who has uh, got a... A, a, a compulsion in him as the one who created us to redeem. And they were feeling that and then watching them realize it was like the green light was given. And the entire people group, the entire village en masse responding to Jesus in that moment. And I just remember being astonished thinking, you know, I, I could live my whole life, and I'm not guaranteed to see something like this, let alone participate in it. And so we spent some time there ministering and, and sharing and, and just were kind of driving back to where we had come from, flying high. And, and I remember my mind so clearly just thinking, this is, this is the ultimate. This is like the end all. And they took us on a, we had an eight-hour drive back to where we had started out, and they, they stopped on the way to this high point viewing uh, area in the eastern Ghat Mountains of India. And we went, uh, climbed up to this high point, and from there you can sit and you can see if it's clear for miles, mountain ranges in, the, in that, those mountains. You can see just range after range. And I, uh, our host had told me, he said, uh, you know, these, these hills are just full of people that have not heard of Jesus. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm pondering the, the awesomeness of what we had just experienced. Thinking it can't get better than this. And this, the Holy Spirit interrupted me. My thought process. And it was just suddenly as if God was sitting next to me. It's the way I heard the voice of God in my heart just like someone conversationally speaking. And what I heard was the quote of something Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 10, where he made this statement. He had been teaching about him being the shepherd and the sheep knowing his voice. And he makes this statement in the middle of it. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must go and bring them also. And I'm sitting looking at these mountains pondering what would most likely be the most magnificent day maybe I would ever have. And I heard this penetrating, compelling word of a relentless God who's always thinking of the next group or the next tribe or the next village or the next nation or the next person of those 3.2 billion that have never heard. And I heard his voice saying, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. There are others that you didn't see today. There are other tribes that have not yet heard a preacher. I must 
go. This was Jesus talking 2,000 years ago. And then the same Jesus echoing these words in my heart just a few decades ago, I must go. That must go is still in our Creator, our Lord and Savior. He has never, that has never diminished within him. There is a passion in Jesus that is compelling, that does not wane, that does not grow dim. The, you know, we talk about sometimes uh, the fire in people gets reduced to coals that are just uh, barely holding a, 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 you know, a little bit of a red tint. That doesn't happen to God. There, there's never a diminishing of his flame, and there's never been a diminishing of his relentless pursuit of people who do not yet know the freedom and the joy of his name. An unstoppable gospel requires an unstoppable God. I knew what we had gone through physically and, and financially, the challenge and, and all the, 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 the semantics of getting to a place like that and then doing it repetitively over the years. And I, I've, I've had times where I've thought, you know, can we keep this up or can we not just maintain it physically but where you, you, you wonder about am I able to sustain or maintain that, that passion to keep doing this? And I, I know that the maintenance of passion is a critical issue for all of God's people but for particularly people that are on the front lines. I know in meetings like this, because we've been in many of them before, I know that there are people that they they will get up and they will share and their passion will be seen. I mean, we heard three people, three ministers give spotlights and every one of them had obvious passion. But I also know that even while we might express our passion, sometimes people come to meetings like this and they are hanging on by their fingers fingernails, saying, God, can I, where is the wherewithal to keep doing this? Where is the ability or the capacity to press through the obstacles to keep believing one more time? I remember about two years ago, I was thinking of the length of time that we have been doing this, Lenora and I, and I want to honor my wife, Lenora, this evening, and just thank you again for allowing all of us, uh, allowing us to be here with you. But uh, this year, 19, 2020, will be 40 years since 1980. That's the first time we had the opportunity to minister the gospel together. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was wrestling with that question of, of maintaining passion and I was thanking God that we have been able to do it joyfully and with an increasing passion to this point. But I started looking ahead at the next 30 years and getting a little scared and saying, can we keep this up? And it was a sincere question. Lord, can we keep this up? I know the gospel is unstoppable, but there's a few times, Lord, where I felt like I was on the verge of being stopped. And I remember the Lord just convicting me, convincing me, I'm going to answer your question. And I went to a, a meeting that was being held in Cartagena, Colombia. This was about two years ago, and Lauren Cunningham was there. Lauren Cunningham's 85 this year, but the founder of YWAM. And I remember listening to him uh, talk for about two and a half hours, which I will not be talking for two and a half hours this evening. But uh, I remember listening to him talk for about two and a half hours, alive, electrified, a man that's been preaching uh, over 60 years, a man who founded what's become the largest missionary sending movement in the world. And I, I remember just listening to him and being riveted, and, and he was breathing passion and vision and talking about what God had spoken to him about for the, the next season of his life. And as I sat there, I heard... Again, the voice of the Holy Spirit said, I'm answering your question. I'm answering your question. I don't ever run as God, God speaking. I don't ever, Kelly, I don't ever run out of passion. I don't ever diminish in my determination to fulfill my purpose in the earth. And I have the capacity to maintain the fire the passion, the vision, the desire, the drive of all those who are willing to respond to my call. I have the capacity 
to do that in your life. I, I want to go to a scripture. I'll look at a couple verses in these minutes before we worship, but I, I want to just read something that Pastor Scott read to us when we had an orientation time in Acts chapter 20. These wonderful words of Paul where he talks about what's ahead of him and uh, some of the challenges that he faces. And he said, see, I'm going, this is in verse 22. He said, I, I'm going bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. And he's talking, referencing there to the compelling purpose of God in his life. He said, I'm going bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me there, uh, except that, and this is kind of funny, but he says, except that the Holy Spirit has testified that in every city, in every city saying that Uh, prison and tribulations await me. I don't know what's going to happen there other than the fact that, like in most places, I'll probably go to jail and be severely abused. Enough to make a lot of people quit in this day and age. But then he says these amazing words in verse 24. He says, but none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You talk about an unstoppable passion. He said, none of these things move me. I heard... uh, Uh, Brother Ben, he also shared in the same meeting a word with us missionaries from Philippians where Paul wrote, and he says, I forget those things that are behind me, and I strain or I press toward what is ahead. I want to win the prize of the upward call of God, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul's writing that letter in the latter part of his life, and we, we all know the story of the apostle Paul, that he did not burn out. He did not quit what he was doing. I mean, he got to the end and he said, I have finished running my race. He got to the end and he was still a dreamer. He got to the end and there was still fire burning in his veins. And I understand this was not because Paul was an exceptional person in his personality. Listen, he tells us flat out in Corinthians very clearly, he says, sometimes I was so depressed, I wanted to die. I didn't want to live anymore. But God's grace found me. God's compassion met me. You know, God understands our frame that sometimes circumstances push people, whether we're on the field or whether we're serving God here at home. Circumstances can push people to a breaking point, but Paul testifies that God met him even in the place where he was pressed and he was resuscitated by the grace of God. And so we have this wonderful picture of an unstoppable person. Because, my friends, we can talk about an unstoppable gospel, but two things are required for that to be true. We've got to have an unstoppable God, and then we've got to have unstoppable people who are willing to allow an unstoppable God to operate in their life. Paul writes also in Corinthians that in all the things that he faced, that he would not let any of it make him quit, wear him down, cause him to come to the point of throwing in the towel. I've had a burden in my heart since we heard the theme, and I've been praying, and I know that God is able, and I never worry about whether we have two hours or two and a half hours. I know that God is able in these minutes to reach down and touch us with his presence and resuscitate each one of us because even the most passionate person in this room, if they truly have a passion from God, understands this principle. We are all in need of regular resuscitation. We are all in need of regular strengthening from God. We are human beings. Our passion, our human passion has a shelf life. But I want to talk about a passion that does not have a shelf life, a passion that burns eternally, a a capacity that God gives us to exceed our own capacity and to continue to keep running with this gospel which truly is something that no power of darkness can hinder 
prevent or shut down. I believe that of Hill Country Fellowship. I believe that of every church that calls on the name of the Lord, and I believe that of each one of you sitting here tonight, that there's no power of darkness that has the right or authority to shut down the call of God in your life. And if there's anything we can come out of these minutes with, let us come out with a renewed determination that we will arise and we will be resuscitated and we will fulfill the purpose for which God put us on this earth. I want to read to you a few verses just a couple pages over in Acts in chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, and I just want to give you three principles of passion, three principles that are key to passion remaining operative in our life. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this gathering. I thank you that your eye is fixed on this room right now. I thank you that you are moving in this place right now. I thank you that your word is alive. And Holy Spirit, we rely on you to touch our ears. I ask you, Lord, I'm not asking you just to uh, stimulate our imagination. God, I ask you to electrify us in our inner man. Each one of us, man, woman, and child, I ask you to do something extraordinary in these minutes. The Word of God is alive, and Holy Spirit, take that life force that is in your Word and penetrate the deepest recesses of our soul so that we might come out being super excited for tomorrow, knowing that you're going to take us from glory to glory. I surrender my mouth to you, and I thank you for touching it and helping me to say, Jesus, what is most important in your mind and thoughts tonight? Amen. Paul is standing before Agrippa, and he's telling the story in Acts chapter 26 of how his life was turned around. And he makes a point of explaining to Agrippa how He was once a man of great passion. He actually was known for his zeal and the fire that was in him. Yet he freely acknowledges it was a fire contrary to God. He was zealous for the law. He was zealous for his pharisaical group of leaders. He was zealous for his people. He was zealous to kill Christians. He was zealous to persecute Jesus Christ's followers. And just to understand a little bit about these verses we're going to read, keep in mind that Paul was a contemporary of Jesus. Paul would have known something about Jesus. Paul probably heard Jesus. Paul probably was aware. Paul may have been involved in the background somehow with those that sought to put Jesus to death. And he makes these statements to Agrippa. He says, I did this in Jerusalem. Anything I could contrary to the name of Jesus, verse 9, this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I voted against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, to curse God. He compelled them to curse the name of Jesus. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He was the first missionary, all right. Missionary for the devil. I traveled to other countries and places. I was so zealous against the followers of Jesus Christ. Christ. But then he says, while I was thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, in the middle of the day, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, 
Who are you, Lord? Who are you? And I just want you to stop for a minute and understand because what we're looking at here is the birth, the birthing, the beginning of gospel passion in Saul's life. And it began with this question. He is confronted by Jesus, but he does not in this first moment know it is Jesus. He does not know what to make of this blinding experience. And when this voice says, why are you persecuting me? He does not make the connection. Oh, I've been wrong all my life. He doesn't make that connection. He is so far away from God that all he can do is ask this question, who are you, Lord? He does not know the identity, but he knows whoever is talking to me demands an address of respect and honor. I'm about to hear from somebody that's going to change the priorities of my life. This is really a picture of the beginning of gospel passion is the question, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Jesus, in my life? That is not simply a question for the unbeliever. That is a question repetitively for the believer. That is a question for the missionary. That is a question that I have to ask, answer every day for more than 50 years. Who are you, Jesus, in my life? Because the answer to that question determines the degree to which passion continues or fades. Jesus begins in everybody's life as Savior, but he does not continue in everybody's life to the full expression of lordship. He does not necessarily become master of everyone's choices. He does not necessarily become lord of everyone's destiny. He becomes Savior, and yet many spend their whole life wrestling with who I am really going to allow him to be. Saul is so stricken by the the incredible experience he's having in that moment that he asks a question and he knows the answer to it is going to revolutionize his future. Who are you, Lord? Whoever you are, I don't know your name, I don't know why you stopped me, but whoever you are, you are about to speak with authority into my life. And the answer comes, I am am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Let me say first that passion is birthed by a person. Passion is birthed by a person, the person of Jesus Christ. This is not just the lesson for the unbeliever. This is a vital lesson for the believer. This is a vital lesson for Western churchgoers like you and I. Passion is birthed in the person of Jesus Christ. The maintenance of passion always relates to its source from the place from which it was born. The degree to which I stay personally intimate and connected with Jesus is the degree to which passion can effectively work and function in my life. Nobody survives on the mission field if passion dies. Nobody survives in any form of ministry or calling if passion dies. The enemy works over time in all of our lives to kill passion. How does he do that? One of his great methods is to disconnect us from the personal personal intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He don't mind if we're actively connected with the life of Jesus the church, or the activities of the church. He doesn't mind if we're busy doing good things. If he can just get us to do that without having to talk to the one who authored all of that, then he will have won because church work will not sustain your passion. Good deeds will not sustain your passion or my passion. My intellectual knowledge and zeal and increase will not sustain my passion. It is only the author of true passion who can permanently sustain passion, and that is Jesus Christ. It's not a, I I tell you, a 
a pa- I, I, I love the Word of God, but a passion for preaching, a passion for preaching, a passion for mission work, it has a shelf life if it gets disconnected from the head. He said, I am Jesus. You know, I, I've over the years... I've, I've watched so many drop out. I've watched so many burn out. And we have all kinds of psychological explanations for why people burn out. But Jesus makes it very clear in Revelation when he calls the church. He says, return to your first love. Jesus understands if you get disconnected from the head, if you get disconnected from me. I've often th- marveled at how people can, can spend so many years working in the church and then they become embittered against the church and, and yet they still try to maintain a relationship with God, Jesus makes this statement to Paul. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And I can imagine Paul thinking, if he had time to think, since when did I ever persecute you? I don't have a beef beef with you. It's the people that profess you that I hate. And Jesus knows that Paul, like everybody else throughout history, has not fully understood, if you mess with my people, you're messing with me. I am it's irreparably, it's inseparably identified with the body of Christ. If you do it unto the church, you're doing it unto me. If you bless the church, you're blessing me. If you curse the church, if you curse my people, you're cursing me. One of the most damaging things we can do to ourselves, fellow missionaries, as missionaries, is go overseas while cursing the church in the United States. I've met hundreds of people that do that. They don't mean, they don't, you know, they don't use curse words, but they they talk about how horrible the church is, how backslidden and dead and how disgusted God is with the church in the USA and how happy they are that they get to be with real Christians overseas. Christians are Christians wherever you find them. Jesus loves Christians wherever you find them. Jesus identifies the, with the church wherever you find it. So it might be a lukewarm church in the USA somewhere, but it is still his church. It might be an on-fire church overseas, but it's his church. He does not see the division the way we do. Bitterness will kill our passion. Sometimes we're trying to advance the gospel and we're persecuting Jesus. I didn't mean to say that to any of you missionaries, but listen to the heart of Jesus. Paul, you've been tearing my people apart. You've been persecuting me. Passion is birthed in a person and we must preserve our bond with that person. We must preserve the integrity of our relationship with Jesus Christ. He must be the pursuit above all pursuits. He is not a secondary pursuit to ministry. Ministry is irrelevant without the person of Jesus Christ. If there's one thing I've learned and am still trying to learn 50 plus years on, it's that the most important thing I can do on any given day is to relate intimately and personally with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to talk to him, to love him, to allow him to love me. He is my passion, and he is the source of my passion. And without him, my passion will not endure to the end of my race. I need to be intimate with Jesus. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, but I haven't showed up to talk about that. Paul, Saul... He didn't say that, but he moves right into his mission. He says, now rise and stand on your feet. This is fantastic. This is a man who has been killing, destroying believers all over the known world, wherever Christians were. He's been jailing them and persecuting them and martyring them. And Jesus comes and says, hey, you've been messing with me, but stand up. I've got something wonderful to share with you. This is the amazing nature of Jesus Christ that we can live A person can live as a God-hater but instantly have divine purpose come into their life. Mercy, forgiveness, and assignment in an instant. He said, rise and stand up on your feet for I have appeared to you for this purpose. 
to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Passion is birthed in a person. The passion is sustained when you found your purpose. Oh, there's nothing worse than trying to navigate through life just constantly drifting. But Jesus shows up not just to rebuke him and not even just to save him, though that's a worthy reason to show up. But he says, I've appointed you. I've chosen you. The most unlikely person. This is a wonderful thing that I appreciate as someone in the ministry and someone that does mission. I appreciate that God appoints unlikely people because I am an unlikely person. It does, uh, so many times my wife and I are in places and we look at each other and I just say, this doesn't make sense. I mean, does not God know who we are? Like in the negative sense, did you not realize how pathetic we sometimes can be? I mean, I, I, I'm exaggerating. We don't curse ourselves, but we do marvel. We, it's amazing to us. How, how can this be? But this is the nature of our God. And there are people that sit in churches in our North American context their entire Christian life justifying their lack of involvement because of their own unworthiness. Whatever you did, it wasn't as bad as what Paul did. And Jesus speaks profound purpose into his life. And when you and I get a hold of our purpose, why we're here, what God, what this unstoppable gospel wants to do in us, Jesus says to him, stand up. I want you to be a, a witness. I want you to minister these two realities. And this is very interesting what Jesus says. He says, both of the things which you have seen, what, in the last 45 seconds? I mean, what has he seen? No, what he's seen in the last 45 seconds of his life or last minute or two of his life are so utterly transformative that he will be telling it for the rest of his journey. He's telling this story here in Acts 26 towards the end of his life. He's talking about events 30 years ago. He's relaying that it was Jesus who said to him, what's happening to you right now, what you're seeing right now is going to be so utterly transformational that you will be telling it for the rest of your life. And sometimes we have an awesome experience in our beginning with God. Our sins are washed away. We know we're, we're saved. It's glorious. And then 10 years later, we're like, why am I here? Don't forget the things you've seen. Somebody needs to hear about what you've seen and heard. And then he says to him, and those things which I will yet reveal to you. I have things that I'm going to do for you, in you, through you. And you're going to talk about them, Saul. This is why I'm appearing to you today. Somebody has to tell the world about the transformative nature of Jesus Christ. And friends, this is the corporate mission of the church. We're not just, uh, uh, you know, in, in our nation, we're not just uh, groups of people that meet on different street corners with our own uh, traditions and our own methodologies. No, we are people. People, if, if we're anything, let it be this. Let it be that we're a people who've had a transformational encounter with Jesus Christ and the rest of our existence is shaped by that reality that we are no longer, we are not now what we once were and we are compelled to have to tell somebody about the reality of what God can do. And I want the story to continue to function in my life so that I continue to have something transformational to tell. Paul, I'm doing a miracle in your life right now, Saul, right now, but it's a life of the miraculous. It's a life of walking with God. There are things you're going to see in the future that you never imagined. And friends, I challenge you and I plead with you as a brother in Christ, do not give up your ambition to see something more of the glory and the grace of God. Do not think that the most glamorous thing or, or enlightening thing you've ever seen or experienced was in days gone by. There are things yet that God wants to show and reveal and unfold to the Hill Country family, to individual people in this church that will become your testimony and will compel you 
and make you an unstoppable people. A passion, purpose. Purpose sustains passion. And finally, Jesus said to him, here's some of the things that are to come. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And essentially, we can look at this and realize that God is telling him, Saul, you've been operating within the limitations of your human ability and your human power and your human zeal. But I'm about to bring you into a realm that you're not familiar with. I'm about to bring you into a realm where darkness and light are at war. I'm about to bring you into a realm where the power of Satan that destroys men's lives is at war with the power of God. But Saul, I am giving you the tools. I'm calling you into the place of ministry where you will know that power to bring men from darkness to light and you will know the power that destroys the power of Satan and releases the power of God. And this is the last thing that I want to share with you this evening, my friends. If passion is birthed by a person and if passion is sustained by a purpose, then it's a power that propels, irresistibly propels the passion in your life. Because here's something I've learned in this journey and going back to my own humanity and the humanity that I know we all commonly share. There is a limitation to our zeal. There is a limitation to our in determination to do good works. There is a propensity in the majority of people to want to withdraw to want to quit, to want to find a way around the demands of the gospel. But there's something that happens when you encounter the power of God, when you encounter the reality of the Holy Spirit in your life. It is compelling. It propels you beyond your human limitations. He causes you to rise up and to be resuscitated yet again one more time to want to live and to want to testify. Jesus spoke to the disciples such a misunderstood scripture in Acts 1.8. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And everybody, so, not everybody, but so many people have just landed and got stuck on the word power and the word power is important, but the purpose of the power is what we cannot miss. The purpose of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit was that they would declare and proclaim Jesus. And I've been pondering that verse afresh and thinking about what he said. He didn't say you'll have the chance to sign up for my army. He didn't say you'll, you'll discover what your spiritual gifts are. He said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And guess what? Whether you signed up for it or not, this is what's going to happen to you when you have an encounter with the power of God, with the third person of the Trinity. You will become witnesses for me. You won't be able to help it. You won't be able to restrain you yourself. You'll want to quit, but resuscitating life will come upon you once again. The compelling power of God. Peter experienced it, and it's, it's just breathtaking what happened to him. And I pray as we are going to worship in just a moment that just a Maybe a little drop of that will happen to us, but when the disciples were gathered together and Jesus told them to wait and pray, and when the Spirit of God came in great power upon them, I want you to think about Peter. Peter who was the guy who was fresh off betraying the Son of God. Peter was a guy who had cursed his association with Jesus. And do you know why Jesus found him after the resurrection, fishing in Galilee? He went back to Galilee because he knew humanly that there was no future for him. He knew he had failed at the highest level and that passion for 
the kingdom for the works of Jesus. It was nice while Jesus was alive, but man, Peter, you blew him, and you're never going to preach again. You're never going to cast out an evil spirit again. You're never going to heal the sick again. Nobody's told him that, but he knows it. And he's writhing in that failure, and this is why Jesus speaks to him by the sea and says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, come on, you know I, I love you. Just let me fish, you know. Yeah, I love you, but you and I both know it's over. Peter, feed my lambs. Three times he asks him the question, why? Because Peter has lost the passion to continue in the footsteps of Jesus, but he did not realize what was going to happen to him when the Spirit of God filled his life and transformed him from someone broken into someone who became an ambassador, an unstoppable ambassador for the gospel. And he stands on his feet in Acts chapter 2. He stands on his feet while people are mocking. Peter, who swore he would never preach again, knew he would never cast out a devil again, knew he would never heal the sick again. He stands in front of thousands of men on his feet, and he raises his voice, and he says, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. Listen to my words. What is he saying? I'm a man who ought to be listened to. He would have never said that a few weeks earlier. But when the power of God came upon his life, it propelled life out of him. It caused him to be bold. Passion flooded his being. He said, these men aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And he went on and went on. And he says in verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands, crucified him, and put him to death, but God raised him up and has loosed the pains of death because he could not be held by it. He preached so powerfully he was compelled to preach so powerfully that 3,000 people in a moment came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head with me for just a moment as our worship team comes? Jesus, in this conference, I pray that you become intimate to each one of us again. I pray that for myself. I pray that for every missionary guest. All of them are busy doing good, doing things you've called them to do. But Jesus, sometimes you get lost in the shuffle. We confess that. We repent of that. We ask that you help us to restore you, to restore our devotional life, to restore our intimacy with our Savior. Help us, Jesus, to be more than men and women who preach about you or just do what you do. Help us to be men and women that walk with you, that know you, that love your presence more than anything else in life. Jesus, our passion was birthed by you in your name. Let our birthright be preserved. Jesus, I pray in this weekend, for church members and missionaries alike, let us be renewed in our purpose. Because God, without purpose, we wither and die. But, oh God, let our purpose to be witnesses, to be testifiers as a local church and as individuals, let it be renewed in this weekend. I pray for a propelling power of the Holy Spirit to be so forceful in our midst that we cannot help but be converted, God, as your people into doing life in a different way than we've done it before. I pray, Spirit of God, we're not asking you for any particular manifestation or this or that. We're not putting you in a box. We just simply can all agree on this. 
presence. We need a greater infilling of God's presence in our life. Holy Spirit, we confess to you tonight that we need more of you. We cannot do this without your assistance. Jesus promised that you, Holy Spirit, would lead us into all truth. Now we confess to you, if we're honest, we confess to you that every one of us needs a resuscitation, a passion, and we pray, fill us afresh this weekend. I pray, Spirit of God, fall in a mighty way in whatever way you choose on each of our hearts individually and on us as a church family. And God, let us be renewed and riveted and resuscitated in our faith and in our vision. Let the the embers burst into flame again. Let us not be suppressed by our circumstances, but let us arise and fulfill that for which you put us on this earth. Holy Spirit, would you minister Jesus in a fresh way as we worship? I invite all of you, brothers and sisters, just to stand with me. And as we worship, just pray some of those prayers. And I know God will answer, and he'll meet us this evening. Let's worship him.